to the Growth Whisperers, where everything that we talk about is building enduring great companies. I'm Brad Giles, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Kevin Lawrence. G'day, Kevin. How are you doing today? And what is going on in your world? Well, you know, hey, Brad, I'm, I'm still at the beach with my family on uh, some summer vacation, which is great, having some nice hot weather. And, and today, we're, we're, we're kind of talking about taking a trip to a place that has really hot weather that's saying, hey, if you're stuck at home, working from home, why don't you come get stuck at home in a place that's tropical and warm? So we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about an airline that's offering some very interesting guarantees for travelers who are a little worried about getting sick when they travel. And, and we're going to translate all of that today into one of our favorite tools for companies, which is a de-risking mechanism called a catalytic mechanism. And, you know, oh. being a car nut, it's not a catalytic converter that oh. uh, reduces emissions. It's a catalytic mechanism that reduces risk. I, actually, I guess catalytic converter and catalytic mechanisms both reduce risk. One Just of emissions. different ways. Ways. They're risk reversal tools. I never thought about that. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what's, boy, that's, uh, that's pretty uh, interesting. Let's, anyway, that's, that's what we're up to today. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds interesting. So let's get in it. So tell me, get into it. Let, tell me, first of all, tell me about going to a hot climate. What, what's the deal? Yeah. So, so we got two things, both Emirates Airlines, de-risking air travel and Barbados saying, say, Hey, come here, you know, Barbados. And I'll look up the exact name of what they called it, but Barbados is offering, um, or here we are, is something called the Barbados Welcome Stamp, a one-year working visa that gives foreigners the right to live and work in Barbados while they ride out the COVID-19 epidemic. And interestingly, uh, now whether he got the welcome stamp or not, I heard that you know Drake was down there as soon as the country opened up, uh, <laughs> enjoying, enjoying their great weather, a good, a good Canadian guy. Um, but what's in, it was interesting about it is that there is a lot of people working from home and yeah. we're talking here yesterday as, you know, some friends and I were in the pool relaxing at the end of a hot day and chatting and going, man, it would be great to be able to travel again because many of us, whether we traveled for work or for pleasure, um, <laughs> you know, but that's not something that's on the horizon. We actually, we, we, we saw this airplane go through the sky <laughs> and, and we're like, Oh, remember when we got to go places? I saw a tweet this week. I saw a tweet this week and a guy said, I would do anything in the world to be on the bumpiest airline with the worst food next to the stinkiest person, anything in the world. Is it would mean that I'm doing something and going somewhere? I feel the same way. So yeah, tell us, I, mm -hmm. go on. No, I agree. I absolutely agree. It's, it, it would be, uh, and for me, I was you know, normally traveled, you know, two or three times a month and yeah. So it's, it's a big shocker to not be. But the point is, is these, 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 what these businesses are doing is they're addressing core issues or opportunities, which I think is brilliant. So for, for Barbados, are saying, come on down, you know, come have a great time down here and enjoy yourself in our spectacular weather. Yeah. And if you have the flexibility to do that, I think that could be an amazing option for many, for many people that, that will be working at home for the next six months or so. So I thought that was amazing. And then on the Emirates side, uh, even more, I mean, Emir Emirates is, is, has been one of my favorite airlines in the world. And I went back and forth to the Middle East, I think 54 times, you know, quarter after quarter, back to back over 13 yeah. years. It was wow. amazing. And I loved, loved Emirates. The service was, you know, between good and excellent. The airplanes were all new and awesome. Uh, the routes were awesome. They had that amazing A380 airplane, the double decker, yeah. where if you're in business, there's an actual, or first there's a, a lounge at the back where you can, like a bar, you can stand up and, you know, socialize yeah. a bit back in the day where you weren't afraid of people. Yeah. Um, and even at first, first they had showers where you could book your shower before you landed. And I had tons of points on Emirates. And sometimes I bring my family with me or, and sometimes I upgraded myself as, you know, my birthday or something as a, a gift to fly in first. And it, it, amazing, amazing, well-run airline, uh, a force globally. It's dominating. 
No, so their revenues down, would nine, be down, right? Their revenues would be down 90%, now. Ninety percent, nine zero percent. They're down. Yeah, they're running at ten percent of what they would normally run at because they, you know, they were positioned. I mean, who knew? But they were positioned almost exclusively international travel, almost yeah. exclusively local travel is still happening to some degree, but that's not so. So Emirates and they were they're they're a brilliant, uh, brilliant company. Um, but they, you know, aside from, you know, having to do notable layoffs, et cetera, but, but what they've done is they're trying to de-risk the travel and, um, and Brad, I think you've got the article there, but they're, they're, they're making it, they're saying, Hey, if you're worried about travel, you know, let us own some of your worry and let us take some of that risk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the key is that people aren't going to travel because they've got, um, a worry about uh, a, I, I could get COVID on the plane. B, I could get COVID at the destination. And I'm not, sh- I'm not an expert on insur- insurance. Um, we, you know, the, the growth whisperers advise that you get your own professional insurance advice. Um, yes. <clears throat> yes, but um, potentially the insurance policy might not cover. So what they're doing, as I understand, is they're they're saying we will cover you as an Emirates passenger, if you catch COVID, you'll be covered in terms of insurance and insurance policy. So it's really removing that, that, that barrier, which sure it's not going to come back 90%. We know that, but it's, it, it could sway a good percentage of people to make that, that leap, that risk. Yeah. Well, they, they have committed that they will cover medical expenses up to 150,000 euros or like, it's about 176,500 US dollars. Um, they will pay the cost of quarantine in a hotel uh, for up to two weeks at 100 wow. euros per day, which yeah. would you know cover you in a lot of places to, as a basic hotel. And in the event of a passenger's death, insurance will cover you know 1,500 euros towards the cost of their funeral. So that last part is not the nicest thing to think about, but they're really addressing if someone's has. But sorry, if you're going to travel, yeah. you're better off going Emirates because they have this extra insurance. And you know, it's interesting. I'm thinking of my own um, travel medical insurance that I have because, you know, I get medical insurance in Canada, but if I go other places, I need this. And it's a policy that costs me 200 bucks a year, I think, for my whole family for up to 30 days at any time. I don't know if we're covered now with COVID. Like you might be flying on your own, yeah. you know, tra- you know, <clears throat> traveling on your own time. I don't know. I'm going to look into that if I do. But the point of it is, is that they're just, yeah, they're, they're de risk. So <clears throat> the idea here is if the customer has a hesitation and you've got two comparable products at a similar price, this person reduces the emotional need or, or ma- manages their anxiety about something. Yeah. It's a, that can be a compelling value proposition. And yeah. for Emirates, it, that's, you know, and I don't know the cost of them insuring this. Or the risk. They've obviously done the, the done the maths and figured out things, but I think it's a it's a really interesting idea. And I was, you know, I was I was talking to someone from the UAE, you know, last week, yeah. and talking to them about how it's you know their for their economy, it's hard because it's a very tourist based economy. Both internationally, they have some of the best beaches and hotels resorts in the world. Yeah. Not just the, the big towers, but that they're actually, it, as a destination, it's outstanding. But it's, it's not only international tourism, but it's local tourism from the other GCC countries or you know, Middle Eastern countries. So, so I think it's, you know, by the way, could you imagine the, the perfect combination is this travel insurance <laughs> policy and then the UAE saying, come on over, we'll give you a working visa for a year. Like if there was, if there was somewhere else, I could live a lot of places. Yeah. But uh, I would I would love to go back to Dubai and I could spend a few months there. Maybe not in the summertime right now because <laughs> it gets up to about 45, 50 degrees sometimes, yep. which is darn hot. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Th- so it's, it's smart business to look at what is the friction point in the transaction or the anxiety point, keeping the customer friend transacting or changing who they transact with. And... Because 
there's two things that's happening with those two examples, Barbados and Emirates. They are removing the friction, but also they've got a talking point now. They didn't have a talking point yes. before. Yes. Their competitors don't. They are all over the news. And suddenly, if anyone is going to travel, they think, well, if I'm going to travel, I might as well take the one that gives me the free insurance. Yes. Barbados, you've already said, I'd love to go there. Uh, it'd be a great place. If I had to spend a year somewhere locked in, in, in a house doing working from home, yeah, that's where I'd love to go. <clears throat> it's getting people to talk about these things because it's different. And so it does reduce it, but also it, it gives it, when we translate it back to the people that we work with, yes. it gives the salespeople a conversation to have, which, you know, you don't just give away money so that salespeople have got something to uh, to talk about, but it helps to, you know, position you slightly different in a tactic for the salespeople, which, yeah, pretty important. It is, and it's positioning you in a, in a proper light because, you know, for a company like Emirates, it's positioning you as taking care of your customers. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's actually, you're right. It's brilliant from that point of view because it's a, it's a different story that you can be out there telling. And, you know, it's got to make commercial sense. So it, it, it's a great example. And, you know, we want to dig in. So, so I, you know, I, I hope for Emirates' sake that this helps them. I'm a big fan. And, I, and I, I, like, I like the thinking behind it to think about other businesses. Yeah. You know, when we set up front, we were going to translate this into, it's, you know, it's another one of um, Jim Collins' amazing principles um, called the catalytic mechanism which is a mechanism that catalyzes, you know, when it, 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 in some cases de-risks the transaction and puts the onus of performance on the company, not the customer. Yes. And, and in many cases, our, 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 our economic models are screwy because we expect a customer to take a risk and to transact, but if we fail, they pay. And it doesn't yes. make a lot of sense. Yeah. And so really the, the, the principle of it is two-sided. One, to get the customer to have less risk in the transaction, but two, for the employees to feel the pressure to perform as it yeah. should be, as it should be. And uh, there was um, a great example that, that we did earlier in, in some work that we did, another book. Um, I, I was a company that was a gravel, sand and gravel company. I know this and story. It's it awesome. Called, is, is it, it's Granite Rock was the name. Granite Rock. Correct? Yeah. Correct. Go on. In the US. Yeah. And they basically are in a commodity space providing sand and gravel to construction jobs, right? To, whether it's you know, uh, construction sites of whatever sort. And what they were able to do was to charge, you know, it was a, a single point premium. Was it four, six, eight percent, something like that? Yeah. Um, for their product. And, and, and charging a, a premium for commodity is not an easy thing to do, but they had this amazing catalytic mechanism. If you're not happy with the invoice, change the number on the bottom to anything you feel is right. And you got to realize in things like construction, like you know, a common thing when you're delivering, you know, you these heavy trucks delivering loads of sand and gravel, you know, sometimes a guy will bring the wrong product so, or, or woman, or, you know, sometimes the person will, will put it in the wrong place. Sometimes they're late and cause a delay. Sometimes they'll drive over and break the brand new concrete curbs that you just poured because mm -hmm. they're not paying attention. Who knows what can go wrong? But what the company said, instead of having an amazing customer complaint line or all kinds of other technologies, it's like, if we screw up, it's our fault. You fix it by changing the number on the invoice. So not only does a customer feel great because they're empowered, but the people internally will feel damn accountable yeah. because they know an unhappy customer is just going to pay less money and they're going to hear about it because if the customer is supposed to pay 30 grand for the material you delivered and the company gets 20, everybody on that job's probably going to be in a meeting later that day. Yeah. So it's, so this, it's, it's, it's go ahead. So this, this concept from Jim Collins is a HBR article 
that people can look mm -hmm. at. It's called Turning Goals into Results, The Power of Catalytic Mechanisms. I think it's um, Harvard Business Review from 1999. So there's an example of a company that did it quite publicly here in Australia as well. Um, so they were similar to Blockbuster um, that you would probably be familiar with, and they were called Video Easy. Um, same video store model. We are showing our age here. My apologies for that. Uh, <laughs> videos is what used to happen many years ago before Netflix. Um, so, yes. so what they, they had a, 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 I would, some people would call it a tagline. I'd call it a catalytic mechanism, right? And that was get it first time or get it free. Really, really simple. So what that means yep. is um, you will, uh, you will get the video that you want the first time, or you will get it free when we get it back in for you. Um, yeah. and, and it would mean that people would literally drive past five other video stores because back in the day, there wasn't only big chains. There was to own a video lots, store. Lots of independence. Yep. Lots of independence. Yeah. So people would drive past five other video stores to go to the video easy store because you knew that they would have it in stock. And it's a great example for the average sort of uh, listener to understand the power of these catalytic mechanisms. So pe these people are getting the revenue because it's eliminating that friction at the sales point. But I think Jim Collins describes it. It, it gives the customer teeth. It, it gives, it, it puts teeth into the transaction because what happens if you don't have videos in stock, if you run out, if the operational side of the business, um, it, it doesn't work. If the operational effectiveness isn't there, then you're going to suffer immensely. But then the intent is that because you've suffered immensely, that's going to drive you to build what the customers really want. And then sure, it's going to hurt the first few times when you get bitten by those teeth. But over time, you're going to build a great business that meets the needs of the customers if you can set it up right. So yeah, and the idea is instead of you know running a whole customer focus and customer service program, which you can do a lot of training, but it's sometimes hard to change the behavior, you just put the customer in charge. And because there's such teeth that the customer has, everything else is forced to align really quickly. Like there's a, there was a restaurant chain, um, like a, a mid market burger place, uh, yeah. around us in Canada. I think it was called Mr. Mike's, you know, mid market burgers and steaks and stuff like that. But they had the 10 minute business lunch in a sit down restaurant. Wow. And I believe it was 10 minutes. I remember I went there with my daughter once and you order your burger. They put the timer on the table, 10 colon zero zero. And it starts. If your burger is not on the table by the time the clock runs out, it's free. Yeah. So they don't just say it because business lunch and people that sometimes don't have a lot of time for lunch, quick is important. By the way, quick is good for their business too, because you get faster turns often um, and it forces productivity. But the point of it is, is that it's for, for some customers that had limited time, it's not just saying it, you're backing it up right there and it becomes very simple to manage because you're putting a customer in charge. There's, there's, there's many other examples and, and even online and is, is, you know, the, the typical, you know, and normally it's with exercise equipment, which I think is almost funny, you know, with exercise, <laughs> try it, try it free for 30 days. And if not, or, or a year, if not ship it back, and we'll give you a refund. Well, you know, that will get other people to rationalize it and justify it. Yeah. The funny thing is, if you're too lazy to use the equipment, you're probably going to be too lazy to box it back up and ship it back at the same time. And right? that's Unless an you... interesting point, right? Um, because it gives teeth. So we've got a, a, a hardware store chain in Australia called Bunnings. Uh, big box uh, hardware stores. You go in there, you can get everything from gardening equipment um, to sheds to you know, chainsaws, whatever you want. It's it, and it's a huge, huge warehouse. And they've got a, <clears throat> they've got a, a tagline, um, not a brand promise, but a tagline, which is yeah. uh, lowest prices are just the beginning. Okay. But then they've got a catalytic mechanism, what we're talking about here, which is if you find a lower price on a stocked item, uh, an equal or lower price on a stocked item that will refund you 
um, the difference plus ten percent. Now I could be slightly wrong, but it's something like that. Basically, yep. Yep. we'll give I've you the difference. Yep. <clears throat> and when I've worked with leadership teams and been using catalytic examples um, and that, I always say, and you sort of say to your friends, "Has anyone actually? Do you know anyone who's ever actually claimed on that?" No. Um, so it's it doesn't dilute the weight of it, <clears throat> but it can. It, it can be a bit murky at the edges sometimes and you want to choose one that's going to be powerful because what that one is doing for Bunnings, it's driving the right behavior because they started off, uh, now they dominate, they absolutely dominate hardware in Australia. When they started off, they were a lot, there, there were some pretty strong competitors and this is one of the things that's taken them to this really, really successful level. So <clears throat> by doing that, it puts in the customer's mindset, it removes that friction. They think, well, I could go to the hardware that's closest to me, or I could just drive past it because I know it'll be cheaper and I know they'll have it in stock. And I don't reckon that it's cheaper. And a lot of people don't, but they've still got it in their mindset. because It's a perception. It. Yeah. Because they're so taking a times. stand for being cheaper. But in yes. many cases, they probably wouldn't be cheaper. Or in some cases, they will be cheaper on some of the items that matter the most. Yeah. So the point of it is, is it reinforces the right behavior for the consumer based on what your position does. And, you know, another simple example, you know, there's probably a few more examples we can share here, Brad, but in our own, our own firm in Lawrence & Co., we have a catalytic mechanism. If you're not satisfied at the end of the day, whether it's a one day gig or we're doing a multi-year deal, if you're not satisfied, don't pay. Period. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think there might have been twice in 20 years it's been used. Yeah. And we do, you know, and once was recently when someone on my team did a gig um and for a whole bunch of reasons it just went all wrong like yeah a bunch of reasons from av to st setup i just probably five different things compounded it did not go well and and you know they, they got some really good feedback but then and then some not great feedback uh, and so you know i jumped on the phone and talked to the customer and i reinforced that hey our policy is if you're not happy don't pay or pay whatever you think was appropriate. You know what's interesting is, even yeah. though we have that in our agreements, it's written in our agreements, they were shocked. Yeah. They were shocked and they ended up turning into a thrilled fat and they, they paid half the invoice, which I was, I thought that was appropriate because some things didn't deliver as expected. But, but the point of it is, is that even in business, when someone stands behind a promise when things go wrong, it's a big deal. Because most people won't stand in front of their issues. They try and hide them and sidestep them and things like that. Yeah. And then customers, you know, lose faith. I mean, you know, it's hard for companies to, to really, truly take accountability. And, and this, these mechanisms often say, no, 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 we're not here to rip you off. We, we want to do good work. And if we make a mistake, we want to repair it, which is probably all the customers want, but We've all been burned and had some bad experience. <laughs> Do you know what else is interesting? When you speak to business owners, when you, you get in and you have a chat and you talk about certain situations where, they, where they've got an unhappy customer, many times they would say, well, look, I think we'd probably just give them their money back or we'd probably, you know, accept a discount if, it, if they got really, really, really grumpy and, yes. you know, we'd probably... <sighs> Yeah, so it's already in their head, but they're just not talking about it and they're not promoting it. They'd right. probably go to that level anyway. But you got to make the customer go through two levels of torture before yes. they get it. And most people won't do it. Like I, I'm a fairly strong minded person and I don't like to complain. It's, it's, it's frustrating. And and most businesses, so, and, and again, catalytic mechanism is training people to do the right thing. We're out for dinner one night at one of our favorite restaurants. We're in a city called Kelowna. Uh -huh. I won't name the restaurant, but one of our favorite restaurants, uh, very well, walking distance from where we are. And there's this one dish that absolutely love. It is outstanding. 
And so I go there and my brother-in-law's there for the first time. I tell him, oh, you got to have this dish, right? Like it's this truffle pasta dish and it's like to die for. It's one of those ones like you feel like you, if, it was, if it was appropriate, you'd want to lick the plate type plate. It, it's, <laughs> like, it's that good. And so we go there. He and I order it. A couple of the kids order it. And it was, if not mediocre, it was bad. It just, it, it, you know, and, and so, and we're going there for my nephew's birthday, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, so I said to the waitress, you know, it's, she asked how the food is. I said, yeah, it's not good. This is, you know, I've had this dish 10 times. It's something's wrong. It's not right. You know, it's like, it's like the B team was working that night. The chef wasn't present. Oh. Uh, they obviously didn't taste what they were cooking. Um, and she's like, oh, that's unfortunate and walks away. Doesn't do anything. So you know, oh. by the end of the meal, and she was sort of avoiding us. And, you know, I may not be the friendliest when I get frustrated. You know, I've been told that. But by the end of the meal, I said to her, look, you need to take at least three of these entrees off the bill. And at the end, she did. Because I, I could tell by the way she was behaving, it wasn't going to happen. And there was no way that we should be paying for, you know, uh, three out of ten meals. The customer and and it would have been an expensive dish. And I only say that truffles. It was, it was, it was, it was a pasta. It was a pasta dish that was $30. Yeah. So and for a pasta dish, that's, that's an expensive, that's expensive pasta. Yeah. And yeah. And you have, yeah, we ordered, you know, we had ordered five of them, I think. So it's like $150 of mediocre, you know, you could have made it yourself for, for like two bucks. Yeah, maybe three bucks if you put. I think they didn't put the truffle in. That's where they messed up. So, so whatever it is, it's. But it's like, as a customer. Now, interestingly, we normally over a couple week period go to that restaurant four or five times. We only went once. And the we will problem only there, right, is that they gave you the money back, but that when you look at it from a financial perspective. They gave you the money back anyway, but you had to you had to go through a horrible experience to get there, and and they're afraid to to to, to yes talk about it or to actively acknowledge that they do it because some more people might do it, but that is because they're scared of the teeth that they can give to the customer. Right, because they're scared about their ability to do their job, which yeah. is to make the meal they promise they're going to make. But if you flipped it around they would have to do more training and they'd have to actually be better business operators or they'd be out of business. Which is deeper than the Emirates example that we provided earlier. That's, it that's, is deeper. Because really that's a tactic, moreover, what they're doing uh, to reduce the friction. But we're really taking that to the next level, which is embed it and, and drive your organization. Because nobody wants to be the one that gets called out uh, using the granite rock example um, who drove over someone's lawn and wrecked their lawn. Therefore, we, we don't get paid for that. Um, hopefully, there's an accountability mechanism within the business that comes back around and that driver learns his lesson or her lesson as a result. Yes. And so, and that's a good point, Brad. Like, this is deeper. What we're talking about in a restaurant example is deeper into the operations. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's almost like an operational promise that our managers will be effective and our chefs will be on top of it making sure that the quality is excellent. And you know, what's interesting in that, and, and, you know, and, and what I love about you know, Collins and his work, and it's, you know, he says success is relentless execution of the boring basics within your hedgehog. Yeah. And you know, restaurants, I worked a lot in restaurants as a kid. It's all about mastery of the boring basics, and it's not easy. Like it's, it's hard to consistently deliver what the customer wants by, by all means, very challenging. And because of that, there's a lot of failure rate. It's, it's not only hard to manage the numbers and costs on a restaurant, but the service example and the food quality too. So in this case, you know, if we go back to, if they had had a Cadillac mechanism, it would be very different. We probably would have been back. But now in my mind, I don't want to go with, you know, seven of us for dinner and, you know, it's going to be, you know, you know, two, three hundred bucks and risk having a mediocre meal. I'm actually, it's almost like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid, but I just, I don't want the hassle of having a crappy meal again. So we're going to a different restaurant tonight. Well, there's a negative vibe. And so if we, if we think about 
you from the business owner's perspective, okay, you're, you multiply out, how many times is this individual going to come back to this restaurant, 10 or 20, multiply by, let's say $300 a pop, whatever it is. Suddenly we've got $15,000 or whatever number. Exactly. And we can, be, we can begin to say, this is the net worth of the customer, $15,000 that this person would likely spend with us if we had some mechanism that would pick up operational issues that would not introduce the negative vibe into that experience for that customer yes. where they would feel like they were doing us a favor by helping us to know that you, you just, you, you've just really cost $15,000 multiply that out. No, multiply that out by the word of mouth because there's a whole bunch of other people here and we all talk about our stories because a lot of people who, you know, real foodies who love great restaurants. And we talk about it. And as I mentioned to a few people about my issue with this restaurant, like, yeah, it's been real hit and miss this year. So as we're all talking, we're all can, and, and literally I can see it from our place. And we're, so literally multiply that by probably five because we're all convincing each other not to go there. Now, Unless I don't want to know the name of the restaurant and I don't want to know if you know the owner, right? But if you were the owner, would you want to know that's what's Damn on your customers' right. minds? Because suddenly you're looking and you're going, geez, COVID's hit. It seems like there's a few people in town, but COVID's actually hit us pretty hard. You're looking exactly, externally. and that's the issue. The truth doesn't get there, right? And 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 because you know, I haven't met the owner, I don't know the owner, but they would like to know because they care about their performance, and they don't get that feedback. Interestingly, too. By the way, I worked a lot in restaurants over the years and consult them with some. You know, when a customer has a complaint about food, the highest level of service and intelligence is the manager comes over and said, hey, I understand that, you know, you, you, you had a meal that wasn't quite right. And our apologies, we've taken care of these and something to make you feel the love so you come back again, of which nothing like that happened. And, you know, it's interesting. I did a, I did a survey uh, back in my early 20s um, uh, in, in the restaurant industry, asking people, when a meal is not right, what do you want as a remedy? My hypothesis was you wanted the free meal. It turns out in a study I did, uh, it was under 100 people, but the study I did, that's not what people wanted. They wanted someone to care and to apologize and make them feel like a valued customer more than they wanted the discount. And that's, and that's what a catalytic mechanism is meant to do is to create that highest level of experience. So you create a happy customer. Yeah. Not just, the, not just take a meal off because you're told to take a meal off. It's really, in, so just, you know, and this is, we're using a restaurant example, but it's in all of our businesses. And that's why customer feedback is also so important because we catch these things. If I had got a customer survey, it would, I would answer it very honestly and the manager would get more data than they're actually getting about what's really going on. And the, the thing about business, and this holds, holds true for everyone listening, it's not that far, when you have a mistake, it's a moment of truth. This restaurant failed abysmally. Yeah. But you can also win a customer over. I mean, literally, if they had done something, I've had experiences before where the server handled it better, which she did not handle it well. Yeah. Um, and, and I was pretty clear. I was going to, I told her what she needed to do because she wouldn't have done it the way she was responding. Yeah. And there was other breakdowns, but, um, and this is a restaurant I have loved, which is unfortunate, but if the manager had come over and done something and they could have done something fun for the kids, they could have taken something that would cost them two bucks and done something fun for our kids and made it fun for the kids or something else to kind of make the ending of our experience a positive experience, you know, they, they could have won us back and made us feel good about it. And but we, we know left. that. We know that the, the, the best customers, the ones where there was a bad experience and it was turned around by our staff member, not where you got the discount, doesn't yes. take away from the concept of catalytic mechanisms. There's a company that I work with in hospitality and they call it CLO. Uh, customer-led opportunity. So they train yes. their staff to look for CLOs and 
Uh, and and kind of like you said, it's not about the discount. It's it's the acknowledging. It's the, it's the um, apologising, and then you know saying that we really value what you say. We want to take that back and feed it into our kitchens and get to know about that. And then we kind of talk about what we're going to do about it. But yeah, customer-led opportunities are all around us. We've just got to look for them. Again, it doesn't take away from the concept. If you were, in, going back to the video store, if you were a manager or a senior person executive at the video store, wouldn't you want to know how many free videos are being given yes. away in each location? It's like the most valuable data because you know that that's where your brand loyalty lies. That's uh, people, like I said, it, it wrecked the uh, independent business model of video store owners because people would drive past five stores. I know I did to, to get, you know, the latest movie came out on Friday night. We want to go and watch it. Yeah. And if not, you got it for free to watch another night. It, so yes, it, 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 all it does because it gives the customer the teeth, you're going to get better feedback of how the customer's expectations are being met. Yeah. No matter what. And some businesses will have that with their online reviews or the customer feedback. But these mechanisms are, instead of an after the transaction issue, it's an upfront promise saying, hey, yeah. customer, you're kind of in charge of this piece. And that's what makes it easier for people to switch or transact or continue to transact. So, you know, the thing I would leave everyone with is like, you know, if, you, you know, if, if, if Barbados is calling, there's an opportunity <laughs> there. And if Emirates is taking you somewhere you wanna go, They've got something to make it more important, but really we bring it back to our own businesses yeah. today, which could be different than six months ago. What is the friction point or, or what is the piece that if we were to take a stand for something that our customers would step up and say, Hey, uh, that makes me want to do more business or new customers that makes me want to switch. And, and you know, what would that be? And that's a great go back to your flywheel, and go back to whatever it is, you know, your strategy and your, your positioning or what you're promising your customers. We'd call it customer promise. But what, what is that? And, and if it's not price, because if they're only buying on price, it's a different, it's a yes. different thing, right? But it's if- trying to get you past price. Yeah. If, if, if there are other considerations, which there almost always are, what's preventing someone from making the purchase? The example was Emirates, COVID insurance. Um, Barbados may be a bit secondary, but you know we'll give you a free visa. You can work from home here. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so <clears throat> what is the what is the thing that's stopping a customer from buying? And then, can you create a catalytic mechanism around that? Because you're probably doing it anyway. You're probably, if they were deeply, deeply unhappy, you'd probably give you, something you would. to them yeah. anyway. Just, so why don't you just make that promise up front and get the marketing credit for it and probably get more conversions as a result? Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Um, and, and that's the takeaway, really. Um, because a lot of people are looking for that today. That's the take today in the COVID yeah. pandemic world. Uh, what can I do to reduce the friction of a sale? Yeah, I, I think that there's, there's definitely something to think about there. Yep. And, and another way of saying it is, how do we put the onus of the risk on the company, not the customer, right? Yeah. We should own the risk because we're the one that's delivering the product or service or experience. How do we actually feel the weight of uh, and the onus of delivery and, uh, and the customer shouldn't have to? I mean, you know the one I would love? is if when I call the cellular phone company or the bank, if they don't answer the phone within one minute, if I don't talk to someone within one minute, you know, they, my fees get dropped dramatically. That would be one that would get me to switch in a second. Cause every time I call, you know, last little rant, I call a bank or a cell phone. Oh, you know, uh, customer call volumes are higher than normal. Well, you say that every time I have ever called in the last three years, what you're really telling me is you're running a skeleton staff because you're trying to reduce cost and, and the customer pays the price for this. So yeah, actually one of the best ones would be some, there's some companies, I think it's Amazon does it or Apple that you, when you call in, you say, if you just leave your phone number, we'll call you back. 
Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. yeah, that's another piece. It's, but the, the, know, yeah, it's it's so simple, right? Uh, you you think about it, but it, it they're not <clears throat> they're not valuing the customer in that sense. And we don't, we, you know, you look at our customer worth to them. It's two thousand dollars over um, many many years. Like we we just. They just don't see the value in it to to, to dedicate. Or they've run the numbers and realized it's better to have they, the, the the cost yeah. of having us wait to talk to them. Most people uh, will put up with it. Here's Maybe. my one to as we move to close. I want to when you go and get a hire car, I want it to be a seamless experience where I can walk off and I can get the car, and then I can get into the car and I can go and and I don't have to sit there for an hour doing paperwork and waiting in line behind seven other people at the, the desk. Maybe there won't be any high car companies left <laughs> right next year when we go traveling again. But yeah, there, there are, it, it's good. It's interesting to think about what would we like. But those right. friction points are everywhere. It's like you check into a hotel. If it takes more than 15 seconds when I arrive, they've failed. They already know I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> they've already got my name. They usually almost always have the credit card information. So yeah, there's lots of these things where there's friction in this. There's lots of room for opportunity for improving yeah. customer experience. Lots. All right. And differentiating so, yourself. Absolutely. So, Hey, thanks for listening. This has been the growth whispers and, and with Brad and I'm Kevin. And so for the ver video version, go to YouTube and look up growth whispers uh, uh, for Brad evolution and to reach Kevin Lawrence and co.com. We hope you have an awesome week and ensuring that you continually think about these little things you can do that make a big difference in your business. Have a great one.